it's always very exciting to welcome anybody when you take them into your home but I'm especially excited because you've been with me I've been building furniture along the way and now I'm bringing you into my house to show you exactly what's been exciting me for the last 12 months and that's been building the furniture for the first part of Sellers home so come on in let's take a look at what we've been making because I think it'll excite you Hello everybody, hello. Welcome to Seller's home. Welcome to my home. This is Seller's home. This is the, the house we bought to build the furniture for. And what we did is um, we went out on a limb because we did ask people where they lived, what they lived in, what kind of homes they had. So we didn't buy a huge house. We bought what we call a three bedroom detached house. So it's got three bedrooms upstairs currently, and it's got two main living rooms downstairs. One is a kitchen dining room. And then this is what I would call, we would call the living room or the lounge. And I think this has been quite an adventure because when we bought the house, there were many, many things wrong with it. We had damp issues and this floor was covered with carpet and we discovered this beautiful wooden woodblock floor underneath it, which was great. So we, re we had it refinished. We've had builders in for the past two years. They've been doing different things for us and we've had new window frames. We, I didn't want plastic window frames. I wanted wooden window frames. So we've had a company that made beautiful window frames, double glazed. Well, by the time the builders had finished in here, it was completely empty, nice wooden floor, white walls and, and so on. And the nice thing now is that, you know, if you go back just a, a couple of years, 18 months or so, you, you start getting the picture. It was empty. It didn't have life in it. And what we had was a blank canvas. The, the walls were just painted white, which I wanted. Now I could change the colors of the walls eventually if I want to, if I want to go for a color scheme. But what I wanted was something that the furniture pieces that I design and make will pop off, that they will stand out, they'll be distinctive. And I wanted something in this room that would tie all the pieces together. So the designs basically are made from cherry wood, which is a wonderful furniture wood that goes to this beautiful, rich honey color. So my coffee table is already changed. A couple of more recent pieces have not changed the full color. And one of the things that I love about it is that just the cohesion of this room, I feel relaxed in it, I feel comfortable in it. Uh, it's not fussy, it just, just feels like a family home living room. This is where my children can come and my grandchildren uh, can come. My granddaughter lives very locally, she, she comes here, she has her toys here and things like that. So it's a living living room now, and that's what I've wanted all the way through. And that's what we want to do with every room in the house. So the acquisition of the house gave us the, the, the canvas to paint on, and, and now we can move through each room from, from ground up, and we'll have pieces in each room that will be complementary to Seller's home, and it'll be a, a space that, that I can design for. And, and of course, the ultimate goal is to get you to design your pieces for your home. And if this is the vehicle through which we do it, great, because you can customize the bookcase, make it twice as wide, half as tall again. You can make bigger coffee tables or smaller ones. You can make end tables that really match your coffee table, or you can go for a separate design, which I did. So these are all the things that make a home a home, and it makes it your home. And really, the ultimate goal for me is to get you to realize that with just a few hand tools, a small space to work in, a decent workbench, and you can do exactly like I did because the only machine that I've ever used in making these pieces 
has been a machine that I would downsize the materials from bigger sections to smaller ones. And that's been the bandsaw. So I've used a bandsaw, yes, but I would say probably 98% of the work in this room, the coffee table, the rocking chair, the end tables, the wall cabinet, the uh, TV cabinet and the bookshelf, so on, they were all made with just a handful of tools, probably no more than 15 hand tools. It's been a few months really since we took over this house. We bought it and we wanted to build the furniture for it. And um, I think it's uh, very exciting to be here at this point where I can talk to you about the development and the things that I've been running through my mind and keeping my um, attention on because it's such a big thing for me to go into a home like mine now and start thinking about building every stick and stem of furniture that's made from wood and designing each piece for a specific room. And I want you on the journey with me because you're as much an important part to me in this as is the furniture that's going to go in here because I want by the end of this you to be able to make just about any piece of furniture you ever want to make. And not only that, but the design is going to be important. One of the things that I've enjoyed, I think as much as anything is the, you know, when I've um, lived in houses before, I built my first house when I went to live in, in Texas or I had builders that I worked with that we built a house. Back then I didn't really have the ability to do a whole house full of furniture. I just had to work. I was making a living for my family and so on. But you know, now I'm, I realized part way through when I was teaching people how to uh, do woodworking, coming to classes, doing things online and so on. Well, we, we had, had spent a long time, 10 years almost, um, just making pieces, anything. It could be a spice rack for the kitchen. It could have been a rocking chair. We did a rocking chair, a different style of rocking chair to the one I've got here. Uh, and so on. We were making this, um, this eclectic gathering of different pieces without the kind of cohesion that a home builds, uh, brings. Uh, and I want, that's what I wanted. I wanted something that would bring all the pieces together. And of course, the missing ingredient really was that we didn't have a whole building to build furniture for, which most people do have. And so when we, when we bought this house, we had the cohesion of the house. We wanted the pieces to fit. We were designing the sizes of the pieces, the styles of the pieces and everything to come together in a single room or in other rooms. And of course you can move pieces wherever you want to in your own home, which people often do. And so that's what we would, I worked towards that. I wanted to get that down. And, uh, and I think we achieved, we're achieving that room by room by room. So the next room we are going to, we're working on the dining room next. We've got the, the uh, dining table, chairs to make, um, cabinets to fit along the walls, whatever we decide to do there. And that was the difference between what we were doing for the previous 10 years. We've now made it come together in a home. And the most important thing, no matter whether it's a flat, an apartment, um, a big house, a small house, this will work for everybody. And I think that was the most important thing was, again, I go back to this thing called inclusivity, where it isn't, um, it isn't uh, what, exclusive as, as in the terms of somebody dresses exclusively or drives an exclusive car. I wanted the inclusivity that woodworking brings. And if you're interested in woodworking, this will tie all the pieces together. So the next level, we've done all the downstairs, that's been converted. We've got the, the walls replastered. We've got rid of all the cracks, everything that was flawed. We've redone the plumbing, the electricity. And now we move on to the upstairs. The upstairs is where we're going to take out 
uh, one bathroom and make that a, a walkway stairway that's going to go to the third floor, which will be a loft conversion, which we haven't done yet. And then the other bedroom, the third bedroom, which is a smaller room, will become uh, where the, the new stairway will go, uh, or the new bathway, uh, bathroom will go. So we're swapping one for another just for the practicality of the stairs going in the same direction as the downstairs stairs go. And I think this is going to, again, make it, uh, it'll tie all the pieces together. And then we'll be making uh, furniture for those two bedrooms that we've got. And, and I think that they're fairly good sized bedrooms, but do I want bunk beds? Do I need bunk beds? Do I need twin beds that will make into a king size bed? All of those things are my next level. Once I get through the dining room, which I have several pieces to make for, then I'll be going to each individual bedroom and I want to cater to children. I want to cater to little ones. I want to cater to a guest bedroom if I can. I want to cater to, uh, you know, a, a master bedroom, those kinds of things. So that's going to be very exciting for that next level, which is the second floor. And then, of course, we'll see where we go from there. But that's the plan. The long term plan is to make this house full of furniture fit families. This is just such an exciting day for me because I've waited for this for a long time, many, many months, if not years, because I wanted to make furniture for a home that I might live in or you might live in. And I I'm starting to design all of the pieces and I just designed this rocking chair. I don't have a name for it yet, but it is for my home, which is Seller's Home. I've just finished this um, beautiful coffee table. I think it's a very nice coffee table and I want to introduce you to it because it took a little uh, a variation in my mindset to pull this together because, you know, I wanted this to fit into the living room of the house that I've just set the living room together, pulled it all together, trying to get the components to fit. And this is what you may have to do in your home when you come to making yours. I've been teaching woodworking for at least 25 years. In addition to being a furniture maker, it was never, never really an either or. I've always been making furniture. And one of the things that I've enjoyed the most about it is that somehow it, it demands, it's a high demand um, way of working. You, you can't detach yourself when you're cutting a dovetail. You can't suddenly go off and have a conversation with somebody else about something else. Your whole focus basically is on making one piece of wood match another. And I think this, I, I've seen this as you know part of my development, if you like. I've become more confident that I can actually make the joints or make the project from very small projects all the way through to massive projects. And, and one of the, the amazing things about hand tool woodworking is just how much energy it takes in a day. Now, I've been diabetic for 20 odd years and, and I, my diabetes has never held me back. I feel very fit. I feel as fit now after 20 year, odd years of having it as I did 20 years ago. I feel great. And I, I put this down to me using hand tools in the day to day of life. So when I'm ripping down a board of wood with a handsaw, I'm out of breath after 10 or 15 minutes. I have to stop because I feel out of breath. Well, that, that's really been a good thing because this is my physical exercise. I bend and stretch and strain and pull and push and all of these things have been really wonderful. But then again, there's another element that I hadn't really seen, but I saw it through people contacting me and saying, thank you, I feel so much better. I feel really good. I've got my exercise today. I've got my physical exercise. I got my mental exercise. I, re I even went through a period of depression, they might tell me. And, and, or they, they might tell me that they were in some, something that was really doing something that was really bad for them, but they replaced it with woodworking. And all of a sudden, 
they found a wholeness in it and they, they felt really good about what they were doing. So I think, again, we come back to the house full of furniture. You've got family, you've got friends, you've got relatives, and, and, and suddenly you're making a piece of furniture for some situation that just makes you feel good. And I think this is an amazing element to, to woodworking is that you can share the gift of woodworking. You can share your abilities as you grow in your woodworking. You share it with your family, you share it with your relatives, you share it with your friends. And suddenly, I don't know, there's a certain property to it. I know it releases chemistries in the brain and it's all positive. I can't imagine anything bad coming out of this. It's been the most amazing thing for me to be able to do it all my life. And 57 years now, I've been working with wood. When we put together Sellers Home, it took us to a new level. It, was, it became more, much more high demand for me because I felt like we had come to a point, we'd been teaching online for so long, we'd got people involved. But why would people get involved with Sellers Home? And I think what it was, the house itself became the vehicle through which I think people would find a real interest because they too have a home. I think Seller's Home became something that you could really relate to. Uh, and I think that was important. I think the garage uh, was something people could relate to. I think the hand tools were something people could really, really, truly relate to. And then, of course, the bench and the vice and all the hand tools and everything. I think they became uh, intrinsic to everything that we were doing. But I think the most important thing was that people could understand what we were trying to do. They realized that if they were going to continue woodworking and they wanted to be, they didn't, people didn't want uh, to be anything but really good at woodworking. And I think we have lived through a period in our culture where we just handed everything over to the specialist. We have specialists for our cars, specialists for our software engineering, we have specialists providing apps and, and so on. But this was something that you could do yourself. And I think that's what the house did. It provided a place, the garage workshop, the shed at the bottom of the garden, the attic, whatever it was, where you could go in the evening, even for just 20 minutes, and you could make maybe one joint in a rocking chair. And the following day, you could pick up the other end of the same piece of wood and make the other joint. And everything started to correspond, this co-responding of the different elements of life. And suddenly you were pulling together pieces of furniture and the house was a place that it worked. So I think the house was important to take us to a new level. And I think we are, we're achieving it now. We've got to a way, way much higher level than we had in the previous years. And this is where, if you like, could it be the icing on the cake? Could it be, could it be something that's so solid that you go, wow, you know, I'm a software engineer by day. This is what I do for my bread and butter. But the idea of making a rocking chair for, for my husband, for my wife, for my children, is there something? Ooh, well, this is, gets very exciting when you're thinking in those realms. And that's really why we're doing And this is what I would love the thought that I'm pulling other people on board, thinking along the same lines, you know, because you can add other crafts into this. We're focused on woodworking. There's leather work. There are other elements that you could do if you wanted to, especially if you're young. I mean, I'm at the other end of my life now. I'm 70, 72 years old, and I've enjoyed woodworking all my life. How much more wonderful that would be if you're 25, 27, 35, 40, 50, that you could put another 20 years into designing pieces and you could build all the pieces surrounding a home, a family home.
when I put together the um, the projects for Sellers Home, we started with the living room because we felt like that would be the first place somebody might want to build a piece for their for their living room. You don't have to build a whole room full of furniture just for the living room. You can you can just make the coffee table. Let's say we just make the coffee table. That would be a good project for somebody to start on. And the nice thing about the projects is, I think you'll see all the way through the, the videography where I will say something like, you don't have to have this rail in here. You can eliminate that. You don't have to have this drawer. You can go without the drawer. Uh, you can do things like that. You can take um, the more complex parts of the projects out, even to the shaping of the legs, the drawers, uh, things like that. You can take them out and you can just not put them into the project itself. So you can make it simply yourself uh, and it won't affect. I will. You'll see exactly where the intrinsic strengths are in the project. And then some things like arches or, or uh, shaped legs, you can take them out, you can eliminate them if you want to go in at a basic level and just make a very simple coffee table. Just do the top rails all the way around, have the legs squared or simply tapered. If you're a wood turner, you can turn the legs, you can do all manner of things to the pieces. And I think that's important that you, you uh, set your own limits, look at your own limitations. Do you have the right equipment? Do you have the right tools? Do you have everything you need to do the project? And you can customize the uh, level of um, experience you have and, and match it to the project you want to build. Sometimes when you make a whole room full of furniture and you think about one that jumps out at you, in my case, I don't know whether it does really. I think the first project I made for Sellers Home was the rocking chair. And I wanted to go back to basics on it. There are some things you don't really change very much. The sweep of the arc that the rocker rocks at, the depth of the seat, things like that. But then there are, there are some elements that you might introduce. And I think the rocking chair had some elements that would have been impossible if I hadn't built into it some features. And so that, that one was really high on the list for me. But then when I'm actually in the zone of making, I just think that I get so absorbed in it that I end up falling in love with each, with each piece. So I did the TV stand, I did a coffee table, I did laminations on things and, and different things that made the projects very unique, very different. And, um, and a lot of those uh, extended features that I put in there were to improve the longevity of the piece, to improve the strength of the piece. Uh, things like that. And, and then, of course, I wanted to tie everything together with a theme wood. So I used cherry in my living room because it's a wonderful wood. It's hard to pick one and say that was my favorite. The rocking chair is a very complex piece to make. But then when I made the uh, some small end tables um, uh, that would work alongside a chair or something like that, what I loved about that, what that design was the simplicity of it and the, the ability for anybody to make it. So I guess that one pulled me into it because I wanted the design to be exactly that. I wanted it to be like a, a level of woodworking that somebody could start out with. So with some basic skills, some basic tools, you could make that table. With the rocking chair, it just takes a little bit more skill, quite a lot more skill really but you build up towards that. And that's what the pieces in the living room will do for anybody is you start off with one piece, you look at it and say, well, I could build that. And then you build a wall shelf and then you build a, a coffee table and then you build a bookshelf, then you build a rocking chair, whichever way you go. That's the wonderful thing I think is one leads to the other. So they're all my favorites.
think one of the things that um, came up during my designing um, phases, uh, I've got a pad here with some some drawings on. This is a dining table and it's got all my dimensions on it. But what I had to be conscious of was that some people had a huge dining area and then some people had a really compact dining area. Some people had a huge living room, some people had a small living room. And, and, and what I wanted, again, it comes down to this thing of inclusivity. I didn't want to make a dining table that was 10 feet long that would sit 10 people when, when in reality, most people have two children, maybe or there's a couple in a family or, or something like that. And they didn't need, they didn't have the room, they didn't have the space. So I've made a, every design that I've done, I've made them so that they're scalable. So you could go twice as wide on the bookshelf. You could go maybe half as tall again. Uh, you could have a coffee table that was a, a half size bigger. Uh, and all of that, and that, that's what I wanted, was people to see that the most intrinsic value in what we're designing is, how do you make a leg joint to a rail, joint to a tabletop? How do you allow for the expansion and contraction of the material you're working with? What kind of joint works best in this particular project? And that's basically coming down to one of three joints. So we teach everything surrounding the joinery is the intrinsic value in what we're designing. The lengths of the rails can be varied. You can shorten them, you can long, uh, lengthen them, you can make them taller or shorter. You can customize these designs to suit your needs in your family, in your situation, in your office. And that's been very important for people to understand. The joinery is important because that's what unites all the components together. So we do focus very heavily on how do you get these joints to have integrity. And then beyond that, you can vary these designs according to your needs. Oftentimes, people have been confused through the years that, that they have to have uh, equipment that goes beyond them. They, they've got a small garage space and somebody has told them that they have to have a table saw, they have to have a power planer, they have to have a wide range of machines that will handle the, um, the reduction of wood. But in my world, I live and work with about, well, you can see behind me, I've got lots of tools on the shelves. I've got several accumulated chisels. I probably have 30 or 40 chisels here in front of me that I can pick from. But in truth, I only use about five chisels. Uh, in the reality of my everyday work, I use one chisel hammer, I use two or three small saws. I've got hand saws that hang up there. And basically, a few years ago, when I first started teaching woodworking, I started to ask myself, what do people really need to start woodworking? And I worked out that with three joints and 10 hand tools, you can make just about everything from wood. That doesn't mean you can only have three joints. That means you can have three joints, but 20 variations on the joints. Uh, doesn't mean you limit yourself to half a dozen chisels. You can buy chisels as you see them and feel a need for them. You can have additional chisels or a chisel hammer or a different saw type, that kind of thing. Planes, you'll accumulate planes when you see them at a bargain price, those kind of things. And you'll accumulate more and more tools. But the nice thing about starting out in woodworking is really with 10, 15, maybe 20 hand tools accumulated over a number of weeks, months and years, you'll have enough to make just about everything you ever see me make. And that's the most important thing is you don't need fancy tools. You don't need expensive tools. You can use just about everyday tools that you can find almost anywhere. And you can make really fine furniture without going to too much expense. I love chopping mortises. I love it. I love woodworking. Did I ever tell you that? I think every piece I come to, I think the coffee table's my, I love the piece, I come to the rocking chair, I think, oh, this is the best piece, I come to the bookcase, this is the best piece, and now I've made this one, I'd be honest with you, I think this is the best piece, I love it, I love it. It's been, it's been very enjoyable working on this. And it's very, very simple. The whole project is simple. It's just a handful of hand tools, 
planes, chisels, spoke shave, and you've got it. It's really a neat project. One of the things that has come up now and again is, you know, how did I come up with my designs and why did I design what I did? And it basically came through a, a couple of surveys we did where we wanted the public that were following me on my uh, woodworking masterclass that had been following me for 10 years, we put out a, a survey and asked them, you know, if you were building furniture for your living room or your dining room or your bedroom, what would be the pieces that you would feel most important uh, to have, to own? Like, for instance, a coffee table came very high on the list and um, uh, things like that. So that was a, a great piece to start with. And then, of course, we wanted other features in there, but we, we wanted to know what people wanted. And, and that was the determining factor for like a bookshelf. We wanted a bookshelf because people said they needed bookshelves. So we designed a bookshelf. And what we wanted with the designs is we wanted them to be perfectly doable. We didn't want anything that was so big and ornate uh, with, with uh, leaf carvings in and so on. That would be very nice to do, but that would be more prohibitive and less inclusive. So I've wanted to include everybody and anybody, no matter who they are or where they are, I want them to be included in what I do. So making the furniture designs came basically in answer to the questionnaire. How can I answer the questions that people have, the, de the, the demands that people have? What do they want for their home? And I came up with a series of pieces that way. Most commonly, we start off with a blank sheet. Um, uh, in, in my work, it's a blank sheet because I go to somebody's home, they say, I want a dresser for this particular space. So they give me the limits of that space. It can be the width, the depth, and the height. And, and then if it's just a blank room with nothing in it, I can design a piece so easily for that room. When it becomes more complex is when you've got existing furniture that you don't want to get rid of. So you might have a mahogany piece of furniture or an oak piece of furniture or a sycamore piece of furniture. You might have some antique pieces that you've got. You might have some very modern pieces from Ikea that you really don't want to get rid of. They have a value to you and they do what they do. You know, they're really functioning. So you want to start making a design that fits with what you already have. And that's where it becomes more complicated because if you've got two different woods, do you go with one or the other? Do you try and tie them together or do you go for a more eclectic gathering and, and then have a variety of woods you could choose for the living room? If you've got four or five pieces to make, do you use the same wood and do you use a variety of different woods? And the truth is you can go in both directions. You can even paint your wood. I think painted wood is wonderful. I love painted wood. And uh, so there's so many parts to this that you can do. But the important thing when you start working on a design is to first look at the space that's available for the design. So if you've got a dining table, 
you can't have a, a, an eight foot dining table in a 10 foot room. It's just not going to work. Now, I know if you're living in certain countries, you'd say nobody has a dining room that's 10 feet. Well, I know people that do have a dining room that's only 10 feet and you cannot have a huge dining table in there. So that's where you have to say, well, I'll go for some drop leaf tables. Uh, I'll, I'll put two tables together or something like that. You have to work uh, realistically. You've got to be creative when you have a small space. So I think the first thing you look at is the space. You look at the floor space. You look at the uh, occupation of the piece. And then, of course, the size of the piece itself can govern what you want. I wouldn't probably want a dining table that was more than 42 inches wide. It's the most practical size for a dining table. I wouldn't want one that was uh, 25 inches or 26 inches deep from one side to the other. But you know, if you go in a cafe sometimes, the table can be 30 inches square or 30 inches in diameter and three or four people sit at it and actually eat a meal. So I look at that and I think, well, yeah, that would work if I had to do that. So I think you, you have to look at the space, look at the size, look at the materials and try and tie all those elements together in something cohesive. And the wonderful thing about drawing it out, scaling it to size like I've done in this case and in many other cases, you scale up the, the, um, the piece of paper, take a scale rule and you, you just map it out. You can get these plaids on a piece of paper that have 12 inch um, squares or, or whatever and you can lay it all out according to those squares and that will be helpful so you'll know how much space it's going to occupy. And I think these are all important. After that, you can, if I go in a cafe and I sit on a chair that's really comfortable, guess what I do? I whip out a tape measure. I measure the height of the seat, the depth of the seat. I take a measurement from the front edge of the seat to the top of the back of the seat back. And that gives me the angle for the chair. I look at the width. I look at the height, everything else. If it's a comfortable chair, I want those details. And that will give you a chair. You don't copy the design of the chair. You just copy those intrinsic elements that make the chair comfortable. When I look at um, different elements to different rooms, I'm, I'm looking forward to a few different things, really. I did look forward to starting um, the Sellers Home series of projects in the, in the living room. It was wonderful to think that, that we were going to make nine or ten pieces for a living room that people would copy and learn from and build themselves and and start putting together the furniture for their home. So when I'm looking forward, I look forward to that first. I look forward to the first piece and then all of the other pieces start going through my brain and I think, oh, a nice bookcase would be good there, a coffee table here, I can put a, a wall shelf over there. Some end tables would be really handy to have. A sofa table might be good. All of those things are buzzing through my brain and when I start looking at it, I have to look at it in relation to other pieces that might be in the room. For instance, um, I might want a leather couch or a cloth couch or I might want an armchair that I'm not going to make or I might already have it. And that governs elements to the design that I have to work with what I already have or what I might introduce at some later time. So I've got a small space, a big space. I work according to my material or my space. And then that really helps me to, to work on the design. And uh, I think going from room to room, like I, my next project will be the dining room. Uh, and I'm already working on the, the design of the dining table. I've been pulling together drawings. I've gone back and forth. Which size do I want? Do I want a collapsible table? Do I want one that I can add leaves to and so on? Well, in my particular case, I've got a dining table that will fit quite a good size di dining table. It's nearly three and a half feet wide, six, maybe six feet long, something like this. Well, that's a great uh, size for a dining table for eight people. I can make it work. And I think this is important that um, I'm looking forward to the dining table, but then I start thinking about the chairs, then I start thinking about sideboards, and then I start thinking about, oh, I don't know, wall cabinets. You know, do I want a, 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 a wine cabinet in there? Do I want something that I can stand wine bottles on during a meal? Things like that, where I can air the wine. I don't know. There's just so many elements to it that, that we, can, 
we can add in and, and look at it's just it should be the most exciting phase in anybody's life is making furniture for each particular room. It is a wonderful experience. I haven't had this opportunity in a long time to actually make furniture for sellers home. But then for you, whatever your surname is, Brown, Jackson, whoever, you can be making things for Jackson home, for sellers home, for whoever's home you're living in. It's wonderful. You're gonna be doing that. And I think that's exciting for me. My project is you. I'm still making furniture pieces, but my project is how do I get you motivated into making your own furniture for your family as heirloom quality furniture?